The Leopard 1 was the first tank developed in Germany after World War II and therefore marked a pretty significant milestone in German military engineering. Its development began in the mid-1950s when Germany was rebuilding its armed forces under the um, suspicious eyes of its NATO allies. They know what happened last time Germany was trying to build something. At that time, the newly formed Bundeswehr relied heavily on American tanks like the M47 and M48 Patton. However, these tanks were quickly becoming outdated and Germany needed a more mobile tank, sorry not mobile, a more modern tank to replace them. Besides that, there were also some other reasons why they needed a new tank. The result was the Leopard 1, a tank which focused a lot on speed and mobility, which was a design philosophy that set it apart from the vast majority of other tanks of its time, which focused more on heavy armor. Anyways, hello and welcome and enjoy this video. So, World War II had ended some time ago and the German Wehrmacht wasn't around anymore. At the same time, in Western Germany, the threat of the Soviet Union and other Warsaw Pact countries was only getting bigger. So, the West Germans had to start rebuilding their new Bundeswehr, which also included creating new tanks. Interestingly, they had some very famous World War II generals help them in building a new strong army. In November 1956, NATO issued a list of requirements for a new main battle tank. The requirements were for it to weigh around 30 tons, go about 60 km an hour, protect against 20mm cannon fire, have a 105mm gun, an air-cooled engine and be easy to maintain. At the same time, heat ammunition was something new and it was believed that there was basically no protection against heat rounds and that it could penetrate any type of armor, so the emphasis for the new tank was placed more on mobility and less on heavy armor. Unlike in World War II, where German tanks were extremely heavily armored to protect themselves, the philosophy for the new tank was for the high speed and mobility to be the protection because a fast tank is harder to hit. In June 1957, France and Germany signed a military agreement to develop a joint tank which later included Italy. They agreed on the requirements and set out a competition for three companies. They set up three different design bureaus for each company named A, B and C. A included Porsche, B included Rheinmetall and C Borgward. During the competition, however, the company from C broke down completely and stopped producing, producing tanks. Therefore, they never really made a prototype and weren't seen as an option. So the competition was really between Team A and Team B. The project was initially named Europa Panzer, and the goal was to create a common tank that would reduce development costs and standardize equipment across NATO forces. This tank was to be equipped with state-of-the-art technology, including a powerful main gun capable of penetrating 150 mm of armored steel at ranges of 2000 to 2500 meters. Several prototypes were built and tested by 1960, including designs by Porsche and Rheinmetall. The Porsche design, known as Prototype 2, was ultimately selected after extensive trials. In July 1963, the tank was officially presented to the public as the Standard tank, and by November 1963, it was named the Leopard. France, however, decided to go after its own tank project which resulted in the AMX-30 and Italy eventually withdrew from the joint effort as well. Interestingly, if you compare the AMX-30 and the Leopard 1, you will see a lot of similarities from the design. Just saying. Full-scale production of the Leopard 1 began in 1964 at the Klaus Moffe factory in Munich, with the first tanks entering service and being delivered to the Bundeswehr in 1965. 
the initial order was for 1,500 tanks, which was later increased to 1,845, with an option for an additional 111 tanks. The first serial production tank was delivered on September 9, 1965 to the 4th Company of the 93rd Tank Training Battalion by Federal Defense Minister Kai-Uwe von Hassel. The Leopard 1 wasn't just used by Germany, it was also adopted by several NATO allies and other countries around the world. Between 1965 and 1978, more than 2,400 Leopard 1 tanks were produced for the Bundeswehr and an additional 2,691 Leopards were sold to over 15 countries, including Belgium, Denmark, Italy, the Netherlands, Norway, Australia, Canada, Greece, Turkey and Brazil. Other countries like it for its speed, reliability and ease of maintenance, which also made it a favorite among the crews. But the Leopard 1 didn't stay the same for all countries. As all countries have their own requirements for tanks, they all changed the tank a little bit in design or technology to fit their needs. The Leopard 1 was based on the Porsche Type 814 design and followed a conventional layout with the driving compartment positioned at the front right, the fighting compartment in the center and the engine compartment at the rear. It had a four-man crew consisting of the commander, gunner, loader and driver. The tank was relatively light for its class, weighing around 40 tons which gave it very good mobility and speed on the battlefield. It was powered by a 10-cylinder diesel engine which produced 830 horsepower and provided 30 horsepower per ton, allowing it to reach speeds of up to 65 km an hour on roads and maintain a high degree of cross-country mobility. Now, what's very interesting about the engine is that, after looking at the re reliability issues of German tanks during World War II, they decided to make the engine for the Leopard 1 a lot less complicated. They put the engine, heating system and transmission all in one compartment together with quick-release couplings around them at the rear of the tank in something that looks a little bit like a pallet so everything stays together. It all looks like one piece. This design would allow them to slide the whole engine out of the tank and work on it if needed, or to completely replace the engine, which the Germans claim could be done in 20 minutes. Talking about the engine, all the power from the engine goes to the rear drive sprocket. One of the key features of the Leopard 1 was its main armament. The British L7A3 105mm gun, which was produced under license in Germany. It was arguably one of the best guns the Western world had because it was very accurate and powerful. It could fire armor-piercing discarding sabot, high-explosive anti-tank and high-explosive squash hat rounds. The Leopard 1 also carried two MG3 machine guns, one mounted coaxially with the main gun and the other on the turret roof for anti-aircraft defense. The tank had a total of 55 to 60 rounds for its main gun, 48 of them in the hull and 5000 rounds for the machine gun. As already mentioned, the tank's armor was relatively light and could protect against 20mm rounds with a maximum thickness of 70mm at the front. This was designed to protect against smaller caliber weapons and artillery fragments, but it was not meant to withstand direct hits from more powerful anti-tank weapons. Instead of heavy armor, the Leopard 1 relied on its speed and mobility to avoid being hit in the first place. It also had an NBC protection system, which kept the air inside the tank clean even in contaminated areas, and a fire suppression system to protect the crew in case of a fire in the engine compartment. The Leopard 1 could also deep wade in water using a snorkel which was about 4.5 meters high and even allowed the commander to climb up the snorkel to look outside. The Leopard 1 tank had a few systems to help it fight better at night. 
The main way it did this was by using a TEM to a sight along with a spotlight. One tank would light up the target with the spotlight for a few seconds, while the other tank fired at it. To protect the tank using the spotlight from being easily spotted and attacked by the enemy, different tanks would take turns using the light. If they needed to use infrared light, the B-171 IV infrared sight was used instead of the TRP-2A. This sight had a switch to choose between three distance ranges and was good for hitting targets at close range up to 1200 meters. It worked especially well with APDS rounds which travel mostly in a straight line. The B-171 IV infrared sight was a passive device with an infrared image converter. It had a fixed aiming mark and a module with three distance settings to protect the image converter from getting damaged by bright flashes when firing there was an electronic shutter at the front of the side. The side couldn't move from, from side to side and aiming up and down was controlled by a device on the roof of the turret. For night engagements, the Leopard 1 was later equipped with the BZB200 passive aiming and observation device which allowed for improved visibility in low light conditions. A shooting spotlight which could emit either white or infrared light was also used and typically mounted on the gun's mantlet and stored in a compartment at the rear of the turret when not in use. This spotlight could illuminate targets at night and the residual light camera mounted to the right of the spotlight provided the crew with better observation capabilities. The Leopard 1 had an advanced fire control system built around the TEM 2A range founder and side made by Carl Zeiss. This system could work in two modes, stereoscopic and coincidence rangefinding. The rangefinder was mounted on the turret roof with shock absorbers and its observation openings were protected by armored covers that could be closed. It was linked to the gun with a special mechanism, moving together with the gun's aim and staying stable even when the weapon stabilization system was on. The TEM 2A range founder had a measuring base of 1720 mm, which made it very accurate. In stereoscopic mode, the gunner used a central aiming mark and a vertical line to align the images by moving the line over to the target with foot pedals. The distance was shown on the right side of the view. This method was very accurate, even in low visibility or twilight. In mixed image mode, the right eyepiece view was switched to the left and allowed the gunners without stereoscopic vision to use it effectively, although this mode wasn't as good in low light. The gunners workstation had the TEM 2A viewing unit, the TZF1A telescopic side, aiming handles, a controlled valve block and different levers to adjust eye relief, reticle brightness and manual control for moving the turret and gun up and down. The aiming handles had safety switches to prevent accidental movements and the gun was fired using trigger buttons on the handles. Over the years, the Leopard 1 underwent several upgrades to improve its performance and keep it fit for the modern battlefield. The first major upgrade known as the Leopard 1A1 was introduced in the late 1960s and included a gun stabilization system and this version also featured new side squares to protect the tracks and suspension from small arms fire and shrapnel. The tracks were upgraded to a more durable design and a thermal sleeve was added to the main gun to prevent it from overheating. Subsequent versions of the Leopard 1 saw further improvements. The Leopard 1A2 included a more heavily armored turret and the Leopard 1A3 featured a new welded turret design with space armor. The Leopard 1A4 incorporated a computerized fire control system, the MS-12A1 sighting system and an independent night sighting system for the commander. The most significant upgrade was the Leopard 1A5, which added a modern fire control system, similar to that used on the Leopard 2, as well as better night vision equipment, new ammunition types and improved armor. 
In addition to its role as a mech as a main battle tank, the Leopard 1 has been adapted for several specialized roles including armored recovery vehicles, bridge layers, and mine clearing tanks. Countries like Belgium, Canada, and the Netherlands have developed variants to meet their specific operational needs. So they kept building the Leopard 1 until about 1979. Until then, 3,000 units had been built for the Bundeswehr alone. In 1980 or 1981, production started again after Turkey and Greece ordered some Leopard 1s for their armies as well. Today, these tanks are still in service in some armies of the world and are also being traded and sold around. You can actually buy a Leopard 1 tank yourself if you have the money and the space to do so as some of them are around in private sales. Anyways, that was all I had to say for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you think I said anything that is not right or you think I should have added any additional information to this video, please let me know in the comments and share your knowledge. Besides that, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Target destroyed. The transmission's damaged.